there's a common misconception out there about how the Fed and mortgage rates are connected. You see, almost every day when I'm speaking to realtors or potential buyers, I get the same question. When the Fed cuts rates in September, mortgage rates will go down too, right? Well, yes and no, but let me explain. Howdy, howdy to all you Texas property pros out there. So the bus in the real estate world right now is all about mortgage rates. They're starting to head south. And right now, everyone's asking how low they're gonna go. And when should they consider buying a refinancing based on where these rates are headed? Now, as a real estate professional, it's your job to stay informed so you can guide your clients through all this market chaos. Heck, just in the last 10 days, rates have dropped, risen, and dropped again. But where's all this leading? And when will the Fed make its next move? Well, that's what I'm here to help you figure out. Welcome to the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast market update for the week of August the 14th. I'm your real estate cruise director, Mike Mills, here to ramble into your headphones about mortgage rates, housing trends, and those important, sometimes fun stories that might not be on your radar, but can definitely impact your business. Think of the show as the map with all the shortcuts to your real estate success. And today's episode is just the next page in your atlas to real estate prosperity. So where's the compass pointing at today? Well, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride for interest rates lately. They've gone down, then up, and now they're back down again. Confused yet? Don't worry, I got you covered. We'll kick off the show by diving into where rates stand right now and unpacking the reasons behind all this volatility. It's like a stock market thriller lately, but with a mortgage rate subplot. Next up, we'll take a close look at the national housing numbers and zoom in on what's happening right here in Texas. Have these lower rates sparked a surge in demand or are the buyers still sitting on the fence? I'll break it all down for you. Then I've got some not so great news that's casting a shadow on our economic outlook, a trend that could potentially cool demand even further, despite the dip in rates. Spoiler alert, it's something that we should all be keeping an eye on. After that, I'll be calling out a recent article that had the audacity to rank Texas as the third worst state to move to. Seriously? As the host of the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast, you can bet I've got some thoughts on this one, and I'm ready to set the record straight. And if you're a fan of tech and real estate, you're going to love the next segment. There's one neighborhood in Texas pioneering a new technology that could be the key to more affordable housing. It's like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, but this could actually solve some real-world problems. And finally, with the Fed likely to cut interest rates in September for the first time since August of 2019, we're going to take a deep dive into the relationship between the Fed funds rate and mortgage rates. How is this cut gonna affect your mortgage now? And more importantly, how much power does the Fed really have over mortgage rates? We're gonna unpack this often misunderstood relationship together. But before we dive in, if today's episode gives you even a nugget of wisdom, a spark of insight, or even just a good laugh, do me a solid and pass it along. You don't need to broadcast it to the whole world, although I wouldn't complain if you did, but maybe share it with that one friend or colleague who could use a little more real estate or mortgage know-how in their life. And if you're feeling extra generous and have a client in need of mortgage advice, I'm your guy. Remember, this podcast might be my passion project, but helping people secure the right home loan, well, that's my bread and butter. So help a fellow Texan out and share the love. I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, let's kick things off with the question that every realtor and homebuyer loves to ask. Hey, Mike, what are the rates? Well, according to Mortgage News Daily, as of August 14th, 2024, the average 30-year fixed conventional mortgage rate is 6.49%. The average 30-year FHA rate is 6.05%. The average 30-year VA rate is 6.07%. The average 15-year conventional rate is 5.95%. And the average jumbo rate right now is around 6.68%. Now, last week, we had way more rates starting with a five than we do this week. But today, only that 15-year remains under that threshold. So what's going on? Well, the good news is, in many places, FHA and VA rates are still coming in below 6%. And the mortgage bond market had a big rebound yesterday after five days of rough performances. And this is all thanks to yesterday's release of the Fed's favorite measure of inflation, the Producer Price Index, or PPI, which tracks wholesale or producer inflation essentially what companies pay to produce goods. Year over year, it dropped from 2.7% to 2.2%, beating the expected 2.3%. And the trend carried over to today, when the market's favorite measure of inflation, the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, showed inf the inflation rate dropping to 2.9%, below expectations of 3%. Good news is rates are coming down. Bad news is the economy might be too. So what is the deal with all the volatility? Well, in short, the economy isn't as strong as some headlines would leave you to believe. And the market is finally starting to reflect this reality. But remember, stock and bond markets don't move in straight lines. They have their ups 
and they have their downs, even as they trend in a bearish or bullish direction. And after last Monday's big sell-off where the Dow dropped nearly 1,000 points in a single day, a rebound was almost inevitable. And sure enough, we saw one. And because mortgage rates, the stock market, global markets, and foreign currencies are so interconnected these days, big events trigger swift market reactions, often followed by a quick bounce back. So buckle up. Volatility will be par for the course over the next several months, especially as we approach the election and deal with rising global tensions in Ukraine and the Middle East. All that said, though, I'm feeling confident that by the spring of 2025, we'll see most mortgage rates with a five in front. Of. The only thing right now that I could see that would throw a wrench in that prediction is if the U.S. government continues to pile on to the national debt, which may very well be the case. But beyond that, with inflation cooling, unemployment rising, and consumer spending slowing down, the Fed seems poised to make some big moves through the rest of 2024. And by early next year, these moves should drive mortgage rates down to levels that we haven't seen since the summer of 2022. So yeehaw, my friend! We might finally be crawling out of this real estate market hole that we've been sitting in for the last two years. I, for one, can't wait. Now, with rates starting to dip, the big question is, has this sparked more demand? Or are buyers still sitting on the sidelines? And what do you say to someone who's holding off on buying, waiting to see where rates go? Let's dig into the numbers a little bit. Over the past nine weeks, we've seen five positive weeks for purchase applications compared to four negative ones. In percentage terms, that's a cumulative gain of 14% versus a 12% drop in the negative weeks. So while lower rates have had some impact, it's been pretty marginal. Now, the recent pending home sales data did come in strong thanks to some positive momentum in the first weeks of June. But in reality, nothing earth-shattering is happening right now. Although, it is still a step up from earlier this year when mortgage rates were creeping into the 7.5% range. So with lower rates, why isn't demand booming? Well, first, remember that real estate is a seasonal business. To see more buyers, you often need to see more sellers because those who move usually need to sell their current homes first, which creates more inventory and opportunities. But as we head into August and September and the final quarter of 2024, it's typical for listings and purchase volumes to decline because school started, and this happens almost every year. Plus, 2024 has already been one of the slowest years for transactions that we've seen in quite a while. So if you hear people online shouting about a housing market crash, Take it with a grain of salt. A seasonal dip is very normal. But remember, falling 10% down Mount Everest is quite a bit different than slipping 10% down from the hill in your grandpappy's backyard. As Einstein would say, it's all relative. Okay, so purchase volume is pretty flat right now, but what about inventory? Are we finally emerging from the perpetual seller's market that's dominated the last decade? Well, think back to March of 2022, when every single family home seemed to sell above asking price and buyers were guaranteeing over appraised value. Back then, according to Altos Research, we had just 240,000 single family homes for sale across the entire country. Now fast forward to August of 2024, and we've got 692,000 single family homes on the market. But it is worth noting that just before COVID hit in August of 2019, there were over 972,000 homes for sale. So we are just now climbing back towards a balanced housing market, but we aren't quite there yet. Now, over the past few weeks, we've added about 8,000 new homes per week to the market. But to truly shift the balance in favor of buyers and potentially drive down prices, we need to keep up that pace. However, with the year winding down, we'll likely see those numbers start to decline. Though it hasn't happened yet. But if we can keep adding to those listings, we might just have more reasonable prices to greet buyers when rates become more attractive. And that could set the stage for a big spring in 2025. All right, that's the national data. But since we're here in the Lone Star State, how is Texas faring in the housing market? Well, according to a recent article from Newsweek, housing inventory levels across Texas have reached their highest point since at least 2017, based on data from ReVenture. The surge in inventory is expected to lead to cooling prices in the coming months. The article states that there are now over 113,000 listings on the market in Texas, and that's nearly tripled the number from three years ago and comfortably higher than pre-pandemic levels. ReVenture's data also showed that in 2017, Texas had just about 104,000 active listings, which slightly dipped to 103,000 the following year. And by 2019, listings had grown to almost 107,000, but then plummeted back to 74,000 in 2020. And during the height of the pandemic in 2021, inventory hit a five-year low of 45,000 homes. Now, since then, inventory has steadily increased in Texas from 68,000 in listings in 2022, 81,000 in 2023, and 113,000 this year. All this according to Reventure. Now, Redfin reported an even higher number of active listings in June, totaling 157,000. That's a 23.3 increase compared to the previous year. And of those, 43,000 were newly listed homes. Now, just a side note on this. Researching statewide active listings in real time can be a little tricky. 
The data varies depending on where you get it and whether it includes new bills versus existing homes, condos, multifamily units, off-market properties, cash buyers, and so on and so on. Different platforms pull data from different places. Personally, I prefer Altos Research because they do tend to parse the data out a little bit better, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, Texas is seeing a huge surge in housing inventory across the state. This is especially true in Austin, Dallas, and San Antonio, where inventory levels are now well above long-term norms according to Reventure. San Antonio had a 52% inventory surplus, Austin had a 51% inventory surplus, Dallas 38%, and Houston only 14%. And as a result, list prices across Texas are dropping. In Austin, for example, prices are down 6% year over year, while in Dallas and San Antonio, they've decreased by 4%. But despite these price drops, home values are still too high for many buyers, which is keeping demand very soft. Reventure also pointed out that Texas is facing challenges similar to Florida's, Home builders are continuing to deliver a large supply of homes, even in an environment of reduced demand. At the same time, many investors in Texas are offloading properties purchased near the peak of the market. And this combination is leading to a significant increase in inventory and subsequent price cuts. By the way, this glut of inventory does have a little bit to do with a lot of new builds that are now coming online after they've been planned out for the last two years. And they're just now getting completed and being offered up for sale. However, many of the starts and permits that are applied to start these new builds have declined pretty significantly since demand is soft. Now, the persistence of high prices despite the surge in inventory is a concern for Reventure. They highlighted in the article that Texas was once a truly affordable market. From 2005 to 2019, home values in the state were either undervalued or fairly valued. That is, until everybody and their dog started moving here during the pandemic, because I guess in Texas, we lack our freedom. But I digress. All right, so while the article does correctly note the growth in Texas inventory, it's important to remember that we've been in a seller's market for over a decade. So, as I've said before, this is all relative. Even with the current inventory growth, we're still not even at five months of supply. And a balanced real estate market requires anywhere between five to six months of supply to put equal power between the buyer or the seller. So for the first time in over a decade, we're actually moving towards a more balanced housing market in Texas. And this is good for everyone. But prices do remain elevated and are likely just to plateau rather than decline significantly, even if we reach that six month of supply. And oh, by the way, I am all for more affordable housing in the state. And I appreciate the, the improvements that we're seeing right now. But we got to look at all this data in context. Comparing today's market to the wild housing market of 2020 to 2022 is not a fair comparison. I hope this trend continues and prices do come down. But realistically, they won't drop that much. And when rates fall further, demand is going to increase and prices are likely to start rising again. It's just a matter of time. So what do you tell people that say that they want to wait until rates come down and inventory builds up before they want to buy? Well, honestly, first off, I would say that that's not necessarily a bad strategy right now, especially knowing what we know. Rates are likely to continue falling and prices will level off and maybe even decline some if inventory continues to build. But by the way, that is a big if. The inventory is the key here. Rates are going to change up and down, but these prices will be dictated by the number of homes available for sale. And in more desirable parts of town, I don't expect inventory to spike much more, especially as rates come down. Remember, we're all creatures of the same nature. If you're waiting for rates to decline and prices to come down, so are millions of other people. And when that does finally happen, home values are likely to go up. And if you don't believe me, look at any real estate chart over the last 20 to 30 years. Prices always go up. So if you feel like your client or you can time the market perfectly, then wait it out. But the better answer is, it depends on your situation. Do you have to move? Did you already find that perfect house that fits all your needs? Because if you need the house, just get the house. You're gonna reap the benefits eventually. Maybe not in the first year or so right now, but ultimately, you will. I bought my first house in 2004 and I paid $130,000 for it. And I sold it in 2009. Great timing, by the way, for $135,000. So even in the worst real estate crisis in the history of our country, during the great financial crisis, I sold my house for 5,000 more than I paid for it. And I had built up equity over that time, paying down my loan, which allowed me to buy my second home, which I paid 195,000 for and sold it for 300,000 just six years later. And we've been scaling up ever since. That's just how this stuff works. But everyone's circumstance is different. I just know the best path to wealth in this country has always gone through real estate and I don't know how that's changed. It's just gotten a little hard. All right, next up, let's talk about another sign that the economy is shakier than people might realize and how it could impact home buying in the coming years. So the number of US bankruptcies under chapter 11 has surged to 2,500, the highest in 13 years. Now, chapter 11 allows companies to reorganize under court supervision while still staying in business. But these filings have more than doubled in just two years. Now, this spike follows the Fed's aggressive rate hikes which have pushed interest rates 
rates to 23-year highs, making it really tough for many companies to manage their debt. Small cap companies and small businesses in particular are desperate for lower rates, but relief is slow and consumer spending has started to pull back. And as a result of all this, unemployment is rising and small businesses are filing for bankruptcy at rates we have not seen since COVID. And while the inflation rate is slowing, the cost of living remains higher than ever forcing consumers to cut back and stretch their budgets. Insurance costs for cars and homes are crushing people, and some are even going uninsured because they simply can't afford it. Food prices are up, and many Americans are juggling side gigs or multiple jobs just to get by. And all of this affects the average American's ability and willingness to buy a home. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. People are struggling no matter what the corporate media is telling you right now. Rates are coming down, but so is the economy. And that's not good news for anybody. All right, next up. The Dallas Morning News recently reported on a study by Consumer Affairs that ranked Texas as the third worst state to move to in 2024. First off, I'm calling bullshit on that. But let's hear out their argument. So the study assessed states based on affordability, economy, education, and health, quality of life, and safety. And Texas ranked pretty poorly just ahead Louisiana and Alaska, with low scores in health, education, affordability, and safety. Meanwhile, Utah, New Hampshire, and Idaho top the list. In fact, no Southern states cracked the top 10. Sounds like a bunch of Yankees running the consumer affairs to me. Now, Texas also ranked dead last in health and education, based on insurance coverage, high school graduation rates, and the quality of care. In affordability, Texas placed 41st, dragged down by regional price parity, median household income, and property taxes. And safety apparently wasn't much better, with a 38th place rank based on crime rates and law enforcement coverage. And the economy apparently wasn't much to write home about either, with Texas coming in 37th. Good news though, Texas did score well in quality of life placing 16th thanks to our road quality, weather, and low reliance on public transportation. Nobody's taking a bus in Texas. Now, this ranking flies in the face of migration trends, which consistently place Texas among the top destination in the country for its job opportunities, warm weather, and low taxes. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, more than 9 million people moved to Texas between 2000 and 2022, over 3 million more than Florida, the second place state. In fact, Texas added an average of 400,000 new residents per year during that period, more than any other state by a long shot. So what gives with all this? Are we the Pete Davidson of states? Supposedly dumb and unattractive, but everyone still wants a piece? Sure. We have our issues like disparities in school quality and the impact of illegal immigration on insurance and services. But even with these challenges, people are flocking to Texas more than anywhere else. So I say, let the haters hate consumer affairs. Ask most Texans if they'd want to live anywhere else, and they'll probably just laugh at you. Turn back up that George Strait song and go right back to eating their beanless chili on their way to one of the 7,000 lakes that we spend nine months out of the year on. So have fun in New Hampshire, I guess. Now, for my final quick hit, housing affordability might have just found its way back. Maybe, because Texas has done it again. So this summer, a robotic printer from Icon is finishing the last few of 100 3D printed houses in Wolf Ranch, a community in Georgetown, Texas, about 30 miles from Austin. Icon began printing the walls of what it says is the largest 3D printed community in November of 2022. Now, compared to traditional instruction, the company says that 3D printing is faster, less expensive, requires fewer workers, and minimizes construction material waste. After concrete powder, water, and sand, and other additives are mixed together and pumped into the printer, a nozzle squeezes out the concrete mixture like toothpaste onto a brush building up layer by layer a pre-programmed path that creates corduroy effect type walls. So a single story, three to four bedroom home takes about three weeks to finish printing with the foundation and metal roofs installed as they traditionally would be. It's said that the concrete walls are designed to resist water, mold, termites, and extreme weather. The walls also provide strong insulation from the Texas heat, keeping the interior temperature cool even when the air conditioner isn't on full blast. The 3D printed homes at Wolf Ranch called the Genesis Collection by developers range in price from 450000 to close to 600000 And developers said that a little more than one quarter of the 100 homes have already been sold. Now, these price points are a little bit more expensive, but this is kind of how tech works. It costs quite a bit to start, but once you scale, costs do come down. Just like how much it costs to buy a TV now compared to 10 years ago. Now, it does remain to be seen if this is going to solve any problems, but I love that someone's trying. We need a lot more innovation just like this in home building, and this project at least gets that going. Now, if they could just 3D print my Costco order, we'd be really cooking. All right, we're going to wrap things up now by diving into a topic that's on every real estate professional's mind these days, interest rates. 
Now, earlier I mentioned how rates had been moving and where they might be headed, but there's a common misconception out there about how the Fed and mortgage rates are connected. You see, almost every day when I'm speaking to realtors or potential buyers, I get the same question. When the Fed cuts rates in September, mortgage rates will go down too, right? Well, yes and no, but let me explain. First, let's define what rate the Fed is actually cutting. The federal funds rate, often simply called the Fed funds rate, is the interest rate at which banks and credit unions lend reserve balances to each other overnight. Essentially, it's the rate that banks charge each other for short-term loans. Now, this rate change does impact other rates because just like car manufacturers pass on the increased cost to consumers, banks do the same thing with interest rates. Variable rate loans, not fixed. Deposit rates, like money market accounts and CDs, and credit card rates are all influenced by changes in the Fed funds rate. You can see those effects directly. But what about mortgage rates? Well, mortgage rates, except for the adjustable rate mortgages, aren't directly tied to the Fed funds rate. Instead, they move based on how mortgage-backed securities perform. MBSs, as they're called, are financial instruments representing ownership in a pool of residential or commercial mortgage loans. These securities are created when lenders bundle mortgages together and sell them to investors as a single security. And the demand for these securities drives mortgage rates up or down. Because if demand for mortgage-backed securities is high, mortgage rates drop. If demand is low, mortgage rates rise. And this demand is closely tied to the yield of the 10-year treasury bond because investors in mortgage-backed securities expect a certain yield. And if overall yields rise, like when interest rates on U.S. treasury bonds go up, then investors are going to demand higher yields on mortgage-backed securities as well. So in order to meet those yield expectations, mortgage rates have to go up. So if the 10-year treasury yield is high, currently just under 4% right now, mortgage rates have to be high as well to remain competitive. For example, if the 10-year treasury yield is at 4% and a mortgage rate is at 6.5%, that 2.5% difference is what we call a risk premium for the bank and is involved in the cost to originate the loan or the profit. So when the Fed raises rates, it impacts short-term borrowing costs. And high short-term costs signal that overall rates are rising. And this affects investors' expectations of future economic conditions, which means that investors will demand higher yields on longer-term investments like the 10-year treasury to compensate for expected higher costs of borrowing in the future. And this rise in the 10-year treasury yield causes mortgage rates to rise as well because they have to allow mortgage-backed securities to compete with the higher yield of the 10-year treasury. So during COVID, and really kind of even before that, the Fed had kept the Fed funds rate relatively low and at the same time, they were purchasing millions of dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities each and every month. And that purchasing created artificial demand, which caused yields to fall, which led to mortgage rates in the 2 to 3% range. And that's why, unless the Fed goes into buying mortgage-backed securities again, we're unlikely to see those kind of rates anytime soon, at least unless there's another major economic crisis. And my guess is that the Fed's likely learned that lowering rates too much and injecting that much money into the economy can lead to out of control inflation, which is what we've had, and a contracting economy, which is what we're seeing. So cheap money was great while it lasted, but everything comes with a price and we're paying for it right now. So when the market expects or the Fed hints at a rate cut, that cut is often priced into the market before it happens. And that's why often on the day of the Fed's announcement, the market might move very little because all the big moves happened before the news was official. Remember, markets move on news and expectations, not just reality. So will the Fed cutting rates in September help mortgage rates? It will. But does that mean if the Fed cuts rates by 0.25% that mortgage rates will drop by the same 0.25% the next day? No. And more than likely, that movement was already priced in before that rate cut even happened. And one last point on this. Historically, whenever the Fed begins cutting interest rates, a recession often follows soon after. I'm not saying Fed rate cuts trigger a recession or that it's even going to happen this time. But interest rates are typically cut in response to a weakening economy. And all signs suggest that right now is no different. So again, be careful what you wish for because low interest rates often mean people are struggling with money and jobs, which isn't good for anyone. Well, that's it, guys. Sorry I got this one out a little bit late. Been a little bit busy around here this week, which is a good thing, but took a little extra time to get this one on the air. This winter's probably going to be a little bit of a slow one, but next spring, I think, will mark the start of the turnaround for real estate. So just hold on a little bit longer. We are almost out of this. Until next week, be great humans, keep grinding, because life is what you make it. So make it great. See you later.